you may not have been hearing me. All right. Why does a good God tolerate evil? We're talking a question that the author of Habakkuk asked last week. He basically was asking, what's going on? You know, why does a good God tolerate evil? We're talking a question that the author of Habakkuk asked last week. He basically was asking, what's going on? You know, um, and so we're having some technical challenges, but this is Transformation Thursday Live. And I trust that you are seeing my screen. <laughs> We're having a special guest today, um, author of the book, Let's Measure in the Minor, um, Teddy Jones. And we are looking at the book of Habakkuk, a short book that asks some poignant questions which still matter today. And one of those questions is, why does a good God tolerate evil? I'm sure you've asked that question What's going on. I myself last night, I was watching the news and several newscasters catching up on what's happening. And the news is just filled with everyday murder after murder after murder. And I know many of us are praying as Christians and certainly like Habakkuk, we are saying, Lord, how long? <laughs> and um, today I have with me a special guest and author, Teddy A. Jones. Um, we know him as the ghetto priest. <laughs> and uh, why he's on is because he authored a book called Let's Measure in the Minor that discussed uh, five books in the Bible that have one chapter. So he focused on a short book. And you know, on this channel, we focus on short books. Teddy is also the founder of Avid Coaching Services. And I'm going to ask him to tell us a little bit more about that. But for many years, he served as the pastor of Grand Spen or Shalom <laughs> Missionary Church at the time in Grand Spen. He is originally from Trinidad, born in Trinidad, grew up in Grenada, and then came to Jamaica in 1998. And he fell in love with a Jamaican. <laughs> And they've been living here ever since. He and Latoya now have two children. But one of the things you will find in his writing is that he's passionate about justice and about tackling the issues of the day and bringing what we would call the prophetic voice to bear on that. And so today I'm looking forward to his insight because he, like Habakkuk, and us, we're asking these questions, why does a good God tolerate evil? So before we even jump into the text to read that portion, we are picking up in chapter one, Habakkuk's second complaint, which starts at uh, verse 12. I am saying welcome to the show, Teddy. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth, and good, good morning to your, your viewers, your listeners, our Whatever time it will be when you hear this recording or watch this recording, greetings to you in the wonderful name of Jesus. All right. It's so good to uh, have you. We were almost twinning. I had on a red blouse this morning and I decided ah. to take it off. <laughs> All right. Well, the, the contrast is good. <laughs> so we Black almost twinned like yeah. last week. So what I'm going to do, um, Teddy, is ask you to just um, read a text for me if you can. Habakkuk right. chapter one from verses 12 to 17. Sure, sure, sure. All right. So the reading says from verse 12 of chapter one, Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you will never die. You, Lord, have appointed them to execute judgment. You, my rock, have ordained them to punish. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. 
why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? You have made people like the fish in the sea, like the sea creatures that have no ruler. The wicked foe pulls all of them up with hooks. He catches them in his net. He gathers them up in his dragnet. And so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and burns incense to his dragnet. For by his net, he lives in luxury and enjoys the choicest food. Is he to keep on emptying his net, destroying <laughs> nations without mercy? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to it's God. Strange, but if you have I like the last question there. Yes. Will you in the NLT, will you let them get away with this forever? <laughs> will they succeed forever in their heartless conquest? And so I, I don't often do this, but let us just pray. Father, I just want to give you thanks for today. As we tackle these issues, Lord, we know that other men of God, other authors have tackled them um, for centuries. And we pray that we will find answers today that will bring illumination, courage, comfort, and help us to endure as we deal with the difficult times that are with us. Some of us are dealing with the effects of murder and violence and all kinds of criminal activity. It is not just what we see on TV, it has come home close. And so I pray for those who are asking these questions that our discussion will shed some light on what you're doing in the midst of this. Why does a good God tolerate evil? And so we just commit this time to you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. All right. Before we jump into the text a little bit, um, Teddy, talk to us about um, your author journey and that first book that you wrote, Let's Measure in the Minors. And um, what do you mean by the minors? Have a cookie scene as a minor prophet. Why is that? And what do you mean by Let's Measure in the Minors? Right, right, right. Yeah, so um, the, the designation of minor prophet, which has been applied to Habakkuk, and uh, uh, if I remember correctly, 11 or so of the other prophets, has to do with, one, their, their brevity, mm -hmm. the shortness of their writing, and also, um, you know, as, <laughs> comparatively speaking, the length of their prophetic ministry, and I think largely to the, the kind of um, prominence that they, they quote-unquote enjoyed. So some of them were actually contemporaries of the ones that are, the four big ones that are called the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, where did I get Isaiah, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Is it Ezekiel? And, yeah, Ezekiel. And um, there's there's one other one, right. but so those were those they they had much longer writings, and where they had ministry that coincided with the other prophets, they were the more prominent ones. They were the ones who were in the courts of the king, um, you know, had audience with the king, and so those would have given them the designation of, of major versus minor. But my point is in, in singling out the, the word minor there has to do with aiming at those of us who I think because of that designation have somehow reduced their level of relevance and importance. So most people tend to read and study and preach from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of persons sometimes have, would have never even read. I actually did a little survey while I was writing the, the original sermon series that led to the book. And then while I was uh, preparing for publishing the book again, and asked some persons, have you ever read from Obadiah? Some persons <laughs> weren't even aware that there was a book in the Bible called <laughs> Obadiah. Much less yes. have ever read from it, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and, and the other, the other um, so-called minor prophets. So they are called minor, but the point here is that their message, our messages are no less minor 
the same major messages from God, the same major issues that are raised by the, the so-called major prophets, issues of justice, issues of God's heart towards the marginalized, issues of the, the true nature of worship, right? Um, and, and, and what love looks like and what God expects from his religious leaders and matters of corruption. And the very question we are grappling with here, the matter of theodicy, why God allows evil and why does it seem as if the unrighteous flourish while the righteous suffer? Those are the same issues that are addressed by these small books. And the point is we must not at all miss them because we think that somehow they are less significant. So in 2014, I, I was preparing to do my stint on the Missionary Church's radio program, Grace or the, the Grace Hour broadcast, that little sermon um, program that comes every Sunday morning. And um, I was, I, it, it just jumped out at me. Why not focus on the one chapter books? And that was when I actually realized that there were in fact five books in the Bible that had only one chapter. And again, I realized that with all of them, based on their brevity alone, many persons ignore them. Obadad, only one in the Old Testament with one chapter, just one chapter. And then the other four in the New Testament, Jude, second and third, Jude, second and third, John, and Philemon or Philemon as some people pronounce it. Just one chapter, very short, easily overlooked. But when you get into them, their message corresponds with the, the, the overall themes of the Bible and the big themes that the Bible is teaching us about the heart of God. All right. So we are getting some fun facts already. So if you are watching this live or on the replay, can you type in the comments how many books in the Bible have only <laughs> one <laughs> chapter and uh, type um, in the comments, what's the name of the only one chapter book in the Old Testament in the Bible? <laughs> All right. So put that in the comments below. It's interesting. Habakkuk is a three chapter book, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a saying in Jamaica, liquor but talawa. Yes. Because yes, yes. as I read this book, I am like, this is not new. And therefore, this book can help me to understand what is happening, because very often we, we, we talk about the Bible is an old book, it's an ancient book, it's not relevant to today. But here is a short book written many thousands of years ago that is addressing some of the very issues that we have today. And uh, just like how we have laws years ago that uh, still stand today. And so as you read, I would like to find out how would you answer some of these questions that Habakkuk is asking? Can you set the context a little bit for us? In, in chapter one, in his first complaint, he was saying, how long must I call for help, God? And you don't listen. <laughs> As if violence everywhere, but you do not come to save. And... Uh, must I forever see the, these evil deeds? And then God responds to say, listen, more evil is going to happen. And God's response was puzzling to the prophet because it seemed as if God is going to use the Babylonians who are more wicked than the Israelites, than the people of Judah, to punish Judah. And uh, Habak that left Habakkuk hanging again. And so he's asking, but you are from eternal. Surely you don't plan to wipe, wipe us out. So in, in, in looking at that, is God trying to wipe out Jamaica, trying to wipe out Ukraine? <laughs> because nations greater and sometimes even more evil and, and the gunmen and people more evil just seem to be having their day. Talk to us. What did God respond? How would you respond to others who are asking this kind of question? There's no hope. If it look like said Jamaica gone to the dogs, all are going to get killed or something at the rate of which things are, are, are going. How would you respond to that? And what, what was God's response? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's quite an, an interesting book in the, the way it 
grapples with the questions, the questions that come from Habakkuk. And what I love about it, I was making this point recently in another forum where we were looking at kind of similar matters or matter of um, the sufferings that Christians go through at times, intense suffering that, that seems to make no sense, that defy logic and our expectation. Um, and I was making the point that when we read, if we read the Bible carefully, one of the things we'll notice is it's, it's, it's authenticity. It's realness, what I call the, the raw side of faith, the rawness of our faith, and how it, it doesn't present a, a, a hunky-dory, smooth, pastel, floating on clouds with harps and so on. <laughs> what we see, if we pay attention, is people just like us. I like, I like yes. a phrase James uses, and I... I, I um, use it somewhere in, in my book in one of the later chapters when James says Elijah was a man just like just us like sometimes we miss that the bible records for us the interactions of ordinary human beings just like us with their God trying to make sense of the world and their experiences but in the dialogue it, we are actually being taught about God, because remember the Bible is his story and theology is really the study of God. The Bible is teaching us about God. So when Habakkuk says, for example, that your eyes are too, too pure to behold evil, that's a fact. That's a, that's a statement about the nature of God. And that, that doesn't change. So we hold that as one thing we learn about God. Evil perpetrated by whoever, whomever, God does not stand that, that that does not get overlooked by God mm -hmm. and even when as we see here as you as you said that, that God is in answering or um uh, Habakkuk is saying to him that I am going to use the Babylonians to bring judgment the very evil that the Babylonians perpetrated that itself did not escape God escape God's attention mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, we have two things that we must always hold in tension: God's sovereignty and human choice. Whomever, wherever, whenever we exercise the choice towards evil, we must give an account for that, and we will be held to account for that. That's what. The other thing that the book teaches us is the difference between God's timeline and our timeline. Mm -hmm. Now, the truth is, when you are feeling pain, yes, one, one fraction of a second seems <laughs> like an eternity. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. A, a second longer feels too long. <laughs> yes. So, so the sense of urgency, as Luther says, the fierce urgency of no becomes so much more relevant when a person is experiencing pain. Uh, and so it's difficult for us to reconcile that, all right, um, I, am, I am in this pain now and I want it to end now, no. right now, with the sense of God's timing, which, which sometimes is not immediate for us. So, but we see how Habakkuk comes, comes on the other side of it in chapter two when, when he says, I will stand on my rampart. Yes. And I, I will look, I will wait because he has a sense that, look, whatever God says must come to pass. Yes. But it, it is set for an appointed time. Now, the fact is, when that appoint, that time that has been set by God, there is nothing that we can do to change it. Now, that's comforting in the sense that if we can re reconcile that in our minds, if we can resolve in our minds that, look, God has set a time when he will take action, when he will bring justice, when he will turn the tide around. And there's nothing that anyone, including the perpetrators of evil, can do to cancel that. So their day is coming. Yes. And my comfort is to, re to learn to relax, difficult as it is. Mm. I, 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 I'll admit it is difficult. I'm not going to pretend that it's not difficult. Mm -hmm. Difficult as it may be to admit and accept. But to accept, though, that God's timing has been set when the, there is going to be an expiry date 
on the reign of evil. Uh -huh. So there that, is that. Yeah, that surely is comforting because when Habakkuk heard all of these things and, you know, he asks, will they get away forever? And right. when we look at the evils happening year after year, some of us, it's throughout an, our entire lifetime. 40 years, 60 mm -hmm. years, 70 mm -hmm. years. In fact, when we look at the broader context, what he speaks about in terms of the Babylonian empire, we know that for at least 70 years, right, 70 years. at least they were flourishing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there, mm -hmm. there would have been people who would have lived their entire lifetime and continue to see Babylon conquered territory after territory, country after country, and it would seem as if they are getting away. And I'm yeah. sure within that time, there would have been people who perhaps gave up on God and right. saying, I don't believe justice will come. And yeah. certainly for some of them, justice never came in their lifetime. They didn't see any turnaround. Right. We know the prophetic word, you know, that I am I'm going to to Babylon is going to get what they deserve. Because even though I'm using them as my hand of judgment, they didn't have to carry it out the way That's it. they did. That's it. That's because it. if you look at what they did to Jerusalem, for two years, the people were under siege. Nothing right. came in. <laughs> Nothing going out. <laughs> Nothing going out. So yeah. People started yeah. eating their, their children. They starved right. the people to death. Right. And then they plundered, they, 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 they raped. Overkill. Yeah, the overkill. the overkill, the overkill. And so people within their lifetime did not see that. When we read of certain brutal murder, I think of even Emmett Till in the US as, as a young man that was brutally murdered by these white men at, at 12 years old or 14 years old. And you look at that, you think of other cases where people have been chopped in, just the, the grossest and sometimes within your own lifetime, you never, ever see that. But Habakkuk in chapter two, God is telling Habakkuk, listen, I am going to settle this. Write it down. The vision that I'm going to show you is for an appointed time. And we love to quote that. It describes chapter two, verse three. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. It seems slow in coming. Wait patiently for it, for surely it will take place. It will not be delayed. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Because if something takes more than 70 years to fulfill, I mean, Babylon was completely destroyed. He, 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 jackals took over that land. You right, know, everything. Right, right, right. Everything and, and was turned contrast, on But, but what, what's the contrast? If, if we pull from, um, from Jeremiah, the, the, the word to Jeremiah, plant by land. In Jerusalem, <laughs> plant vineyards because <laughs> the exile will end. And so, I, I mean, that's that's a shifting to be mm. able to say, but you, you hear God saying, all right, this is going to happen. Calamity is coming. It's going to last for 70 years. First of all, there is a term limit to it. And I'm, I am challenging you to act by faith in me that not, not only will this end, but that you will be returning. And so in preparation for that, while all you can see now is the doom and gloom, take a step of faith and make an investment now, from now, that you will reap when the expiration of the reign of terror comes. Now, only those who can act on that faith will benefit in it because you, you don't see it. All you can see now is the doom that is here and present and pending. But God said, Buy land, no. Plant vineyard hmm. because the end is marked and you, you and your people will return to flourishing right here so from where wow. you'll be taken. So how now shall we live in Jamaica? Um, many people um, want to migrate. For those of us who are not leaving Jamaica, <laughs> is that <laughs> word of advice relevant to us? It, it, it is, should we it is. buy land, build in spite of the anarchy? Is that what <laughs> we should do and pray for the peace of Jamaica and the prosperity <laughs> of Jamaica or stop praying? <laughs> <laughs> and you see, we, we, can't, we, can't, we can't stop praying. We can't stop, stop hoping. When, when in 2020, when the pandemic, COVID pandemic was just coming in, I said to persons, we need to look 
on the other side of the curve, okay? I mean, we can't predict signs. We don't know how long it is going to last for. But if we use the, the pointers from history, there is a cyclical nature to these outbreaks. There were previous pandemics before, there were previous outbreaks before. What we have to learn to do is learn from, learn the lessons from the past. Just as all the scripture says that these very things were written for our benefit. Yes. Yeah, so when we read the stories of, again, these ordinary people in the scripture, it is for our benefit so that we, we don't make the same mistakes. So we know that in our likelihood, it's going to come to an end. And so we can begin to plan from now, how are we going to live on the other side of yes. the calamity? And, and yes. that's the difference that the God that we serve, who we know exists outside of time. We are trapped in a timeline, but he isn't. Mm -hmm. And he is with us in the spirit to make that difference. To, that, that is where the, the, the indwelling of this, the Holy Spirit is supposed to make that difference in, in how we think. So we don't think fatalistically. We don't think and beat the air. We continue to pray. We continue to hope. We continue to plan. And we continue to execute, yeah. not in our strength, but knowing that we have a God who's, who is already on the other side mm -hmm. of the disaster and who is, is going to keep us through this and bring us to the other side of it. That's the difference that his words that are recorded for us of how he promised and came through to the letter, right? To the letter. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, when you look at the, the connection, one of the connections between um, Habakkuk's statements there and, and over in Obadiah is the, yes. the, the confidence that the Babylonians and these um, armies of the yes. foreign nations had in their fortitude, in, yes. the, in the military might and in the, the strength of their armies and how they put their trust in that. Yes. Even when God sent warning to them that to them that they, they will be brought down, they yes. put their confidence in that and they, they convinced themselves that they were invincible. Yes. But sure enough, the word that came to, to them from God through his prophet is that you will be brought down. Yes. And so the lesson for us is to always remain humble. Yes. And know that where we see even our tormentors exalting themselves, basking in the fruit of their ill-gotten gain and basking in the power of their, by their ill-gotten means, that, that that is a sure sign that their end is marked because God's word says God resists the proud and Amen. He elevates the humble. I love that. And I like you say, think about the other side, because the focus of this program, why I started these book studies, is so that we can change the way we think in order to change the way we live. Right. Right. And so if you are just focusing on the conditions and the evil, then it's going to affect the way you live and you're going to be fatalistic. But you are reminding us that, you know, there's a day set for their punishment. And if you focus on that, uh, you will live differently. And so chapter two, verse nine says, what sorrow awaits you who build big houses with mm -hmm. money gained dishonestly? And we think right. of the scammers and <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> you right. believe your wealth will buy security, putting your family's nest beyond the reach of danger. But by the murders you committed, you have shamed your name and forfeited your lives. The very stones in the walls cry out against you and the beams in the ceilings echo the complaint. What sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? Has not the Lord of heaven's armies promised that mm -hmm. the wealth of the nations will turn to ashes? They work so hard, but in vain. And here comes the assurance in verse 14. Because sometimes we're looking on non-Christians are prospering. Yes. Yes. yes, So many Christians are poor and it seems as if nothing not happening for us. Habakkuk got the assurance for as the waters fill the sea, the earth will be filled with an awareness yes. of the glory of the Lord. And what sorrow awaits those 
who do such things. So that is the assurance. So we are happy for books like this so that when we feel the sting of pain now, and we see the corruption and we say, is there, we cannot like others say there is no hope because we know that God will punish evil. We may not know when, but there is a divine agenda as um, Garfield said last week. It's not about God's ability. It's about mm -hmm. God's agenda. Right. And so have a got this assurance. Listen, the just shall live by faith. Can you break that down for me? Because I've always heard that. And sometimes it's difficult for me. To, what does it mean? The just shall live by faith in this context where God is giving Habakkuk some assurance. He's not directly answering all of the questions, but Habakkuk was able to say, no, this is God answering the righteous. This is not Habakkuk saying it. In yeah. 2 verse 4, look yeah. at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Explain that. How does that work practically? What does it mean? Yeah, right. Um, you know, it, 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 it comes down to the difference, like I was saying, the difference that our faith in God makes in real terms. On the first hand, it is an affirmation that justice is the nature of God. It is the heart yes. of God. And it is a central characteristic and pursuit of the people of God that we should yes. be people who desire justice, people who practice justice, justice, and people who seek for and agitate for for justice on behalf of others. The, 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 the justice is so closely connected to love. And we know that love defines that God is love. God yes. doesn't act in a loving way or do love. God is love. Yes. And justice flows right out of that. Justice for, 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 for the other. It, it is that how we demonstrate, our, we demonstrate our love for God by our love for others. And loving others means wanting what is, what is fair, what is equitable right? um, for, for them and to, to, to ensure that no one is taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Now that requires faith. And he's, God is also reminding us that those who pursue justice will gain a blessing from him as a result of their faithfulness to him as the God of justice, and as a result of their faithfulness to their fellow humans as they seek and pursue justice, right? Now, it, 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 it often, I think people think that, well, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a politician, I'm not a policymaker, um, that's for the government or that's for the lawyers, mm -hmm. that's for the civic society groups, but, um, even the smallest children learn, can learn how to pursue justice. Mm -hmm. the, the, the smallest children in primary school and even kinder, they, they, they understand, have a sense of what is fair. Yes. But here they say, that's not fair. You shouldn't do that because that's not fair. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's, it is important for us to pick up on that and from there build that sense of that it is, it is good, it is right to stand up for the fairness, for fairness in our surroundings. Because that, that's where it begins, where we cultivate a culture of standing up for what is fair and what is right for each other. Because when we don't get it right at the, in the small things, it is when we do, we fail to get it right in the larger things. And then when, when self, in, as the older we get, the more self-interest kicks in, and things like self-preservation, and we only seem to have a concern for justice when we are the ones who become yeah. the victims of yes. injustice. Yes. We, and we don't, we don't see the connection. If we don't practice habitually the pursuit of justice, it then becomes very individualistic. And then there's who is, who is there to stand with you other than maybe the immediate family members? Because it has become so individualistic as opposed to a culture where we, we have a, a, a rallying sense around each other. When I, I don't need to know you 
You don't need to be my friend or my family member. Right is right. And if this is right, I should be willing to, to lend my voice. And even if it's just to stand in solidarity with you to say that, yeah, this is what is just in this case. And, and the Bible is saying that those who practice justice, their faith, their, their faithfulness to that is what is going to allow them to live. They will thrive on the basis of that. Okay? It seems counterintuitive, you know, that the, the better way, as you say, to get ahead is to scheme and to defraud and to look out for your, your own self. Yes, some will benefit and some will, will get many things by that way. But everyone stands to gain so much more when we think more about the other and we think more about how can I help someone else to get some of this yeah. world's goods instead of just thinking about myself. That's, that's justice. Yeah, yeah. So we're getting there as we wrap up that the hope comes from the fact when you ask, why does a good God tolerate evil? Uh, is that you have to remember that God is a God of justice. And so if you remember that God is a God of justice and he has a timeline to fix things and to deal with injustice, then what should be our response? And I think this is what leads us to the final chapter. When you know that your God is sovereign, that despite how you feel, the violence around, the corruption, and things just seem out of control. He's still in control. Right. The divine <laughs> agenda continues. Then what should be your response? I think that leads us to praise and more prayer and more worship, don't you think? <laughs> Absolutely. But, but, but also, Kamika, Ruth, also more action. Because more a action. part of why injustice prevails and seems so prevalent and the wicked seems to be flourishing more. A part of it, which we don't often look at, is the very inaction that we were talking about just now, that less of us are involved in standing up for justice. Mm. Less of us don't want to get into the, the fight against injustice. And so th those who are the purveyors of injustice seem to have the upper hand. So it's not just that God is not doing anything. Let's never forget that God acts through us, that we are his yes. agents. And so to the extent that more of us take a hands-off approach or pretend that we don't see the injustice, that is an extent to which it would seem as if God is not doing anything. And, and so we can't absorb ourselves. We must not from the action. We, we worship, we should worship more, trust more in his sovereignty and his timeline and his agenda. But we must also be prepared to get into the battle for truth. Yes, more. yes, that is true. I was saying that in light of his response in chapter three, yes. having heard this from God, he took a stand because right. it's entitled his prayer and praise. Yes. So whereas it started with a personal crisis, that God, where are you? God is so good that he responded to Habakkuk. And at the end, he was firm in his faith and he could he, he would pray. But I, I agree that we exist to stand up for the rights of those who cannot stand up for themselves. And yeah. we need the grace of God, the strength of God, the boldness of the spirit to do that. Because in standing up to some of these um, bullies and these perpetrators of injustice, they yes. often come after you yes. and it is not going to be comfortable. So only by the grace of mm -hmm. God and the faith, uh, will really we do that. Faith. And we have to, we yes. have to. Yes, that's where the faith comes in again. The just, yes. we live, we will live by our faith. Yeah. Live, live yeah. by yeah. We can, live We should believe it. that the faith in the God of justice is with us. Yes. as we seek justice. Ah, I, I know we're wrapping up, but what are some of the practical ways that we can stand up for justice? It's in our, for, for us in Jamaica, those watching, it's in our national anthem, <laughs> justice, <laughs> truth, be yes. ours forever. Yes. You know, how do we stand up for justice? 
um, in times like these? What, what are some of the practical actions? We know we'll have to pray and we continue praising. We continue believing that God will ultimately fix it. But outside of that, in the natural, what do we do? Right. So we were talking just now about starting with the, the children. Um, don't just wait for them to discover it on their own. It is important for, for parents, uh, Sabbath school teachers, Sunday school teachers, um, at the, the, the kinder prep, etc. early, begin to have conversations with them about uh, what justice looks like, what is yes. fair. And use simple scenarios. John, uh, John has his snack and Mary takes John's snack. Is that, is that fair? You know, simple conversations uh, so that they begin to have a concept that anyone who takes away the property of someone else is acting unfairly, is acting in an unjust manner. So we right. begin the conversation to, to give them concrete ideas, yeah? When they are con uh, forming concretization at the, in the, in the, at the cognitive development and their moral development. So we will be, to be intentional about it. And then at every level now of our Christian education programs, of our moral and ethical forums we we use different scenarios um at the community level the examples would vary but but i believe we have to be intentional about having those conversations because for i find for a lot of people we we, we simply are not making the connections between the things that we consider normal in our society and the fact that these are acts of injustice mm -hmm. so that we even we have, we have um, normalized them and even um, rationalized them as if they are actually correct and right actions. So we have to begin to challenge the mindsets that have been formed over the years, right? Then um, hosting community forum where some of these issues can be ventilated. Um, and I find that the use of drama, for example, has been very effective. There are some dramatic productions that uh, are already available. Others can be developed um, right there um, just to dramatize scenarios. Again, when people get to watch the thing unfolding, it's a little bit different than you just like doing a lecture and say, well, this is corruption and we must fight against corruption. Okay, so, so you help people to see how is this now connected to our um, antithetical to national development? Um, Professor Trevor Monroe and National Integrity Action. They have some ads, for example, where they, they show the connection between corruption in public life and lack of funds for things like healthcare and, and education, stuff like that. So people can see the connections. Um, being, uh, being more aware of what's happening at the national and international level where corruption and, and injustice is concerned, and um, so making sure that we are aware, but also adding a voice, like even writing a letter to the editor, um, using your own access to social media and, and the internet, uh, make a video. You never know. I, I saw this video that this police officer did recently where he sat down and called the nation to prayer against the crime and violence. And within, within a one hour period, no less than a dozen persons forwarded that video to me. Then I, I, I booked it up on Twitter, I booked it up on Facebook, right? I don't think he, 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 could have, he would have imagined that, that his little action would have gone so far. We, we, we underestimate the power that we have now with modern technology to getting our voice out there and we, we never know who that one person is who may be contemplating an unjust act, for example, come across something we say, and that sets them thinking. And, and if, if I put something out there into the atmosphere that changes one person's mind away from a corrupt act, then, then that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a global win for me. Because right, the, the right. corrupt action of that one person can literally influence the entire world. All right. Russia and Ukraine far removed, they are in conflict, and the entire world is now affected because 
we are we are a, a community as human beings and we must never underestimate the power of one individual taking a tangible action i love it so practical you know there was there, there are times we come down on Twitter, persons have come down on Twitter or Facebook because they understand the power of social media to uh, create change in mm -hmm. a nation, to create change in scenarios. So you're saying yeah. start the conversations early with the children, teach them be, as an individual, be a voice, speak up. In fact, that's what the scripture says, speak up on behalf. But there are also things we can do. There are sites that you can go i think it's change.org or one of them where right, right, there are right. these legislations if you have an issue you get others on board in jamaica for example with the love march movement you have daniel dr daniel thomas who mm -hmm. will have you sign petitions there are lawyers who will actually go in parliament and lobby for certain things so at different levels we can be part of groups that are taking action and we can also individually use the platforms that we have right. to be a voice to shed light to campaign and most of all to teach and demonstrate um, those things so i want to thank you for bringing practical um, strategies and helping us really think through these issues don't just say why does a good god tolerate evil and that's it so while we pray, we must act. How can persons get in touch with you, Teddy, to find out more about what you do, maybe to invite you? Um, what do you have to offer as we bring this episode to a close? Because I think anybody who watches this, they would want to continue the dialogue and the conversation. So talk to us. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. And thanks. Thanks for that opportunity. Good. All right. So. Um, so you have seen the, the book cover on the, the display at the start. You just, I have a copy here in my hand. All right. So um, the book is available on Amazon. Right. There you go. Um, just look for that on Amazon and you'll get it hard copy or Kindle. I also have copies, hard copies locally. Um, the telephone number is 876-826-1500. Easy. 826-1500. And you can find me on Twitter at teddyajones.com. Same for Facebook um, at teddyajones.com. In terms of, um, I provide coaching services. I'm a certified life coach and NLP master practitioner, neuro-linguistic programming master practitioner, certified life coach, avid coaching services, is the, the name of the, the coaching company. All right, you can find me there. Website, www.teddyajones.com. And um, from there, you'll be able to send a message or via email and so on to connect with me. You know, I'm available for preaching, teaching, seminars, leadership consultancy, uh, writing, coaching, you know, a full range of services. But my, my mission under God is to empower God's people to help persons to become all that they can and should be fulfilling their purpose in our world, in our time. Amen. I love it. Thank you so much. And as we go, we just want you to put your takeaway below. My takeaway today is that in spite of what is happening, pray plant, build <laughs> in confidence that despite what is happening, that God will deal with it. What's your takeaway? Remember, change the way you think so that you can change the way you live and let us live out our learning. Tough for now until